Before we get straight into the podcast, I just want to give a huge shout out to our sponsors, D Kirby GA Star. Declan Kirby GA Star Championship Journey, it's a series of GA team children's books written by primary school teacher and GA coach Michael Egan. You can check it out in the link in the description down below, of course, as well. Follow the trials and tribulations of Declan Kirby and his team at Smith Green Gaelic Football Club, recently formed a promising GA team. The book is now available in Easton's and all good bookshops, so check it out in the description down below and let's get straight into it. Into it. Welcome back to GA Fan TV. My name is Aaron. I'm delighted to be joined here today by Damien Carter of Leash GA TV to run back through the hurling results, of course, from the weekend. Uh, obviously, we had three big games, of course, two big games in the Leinster Senior Hurling Championship between Wexford and Leash, and obviously Dublin and Antrim. And then, of course, we had Waterford taking on Clare, of course, in the, in the Munster Senior Hurling Championship as well. I suppose, first of all, Damien, how's things with yourself? All good, all good. Thanks, Aaron. Thanks for having me on. Uh, disappointed, obviously, as the leash man this weekend, but I go otherwise. Yeah, yeah, I suppose not a lot to to shout about. Unfortunately, as a leash man at the moment, I mean, in the football as well, it's just not really. I suppose it's like everyone's delighted to have the football and hurling back, but I'm sure for yourselves, you're probably almost sick of it now at this stage. Yeah, it's a bleak time, but as you said, both senior and senior football and hurling, um, not a win between either of them in either league or now championship as well, and big games coming up now in the next two or three weeks for Leash um, to either turn their season or have a, an absolute nightmare of a season. Yeah, 100%. And I suppose we'll, we'll start by looking at the, the Wexford and Leash game. Um, it was Wexford 5-31, Leash 1-23. I suppose what were your thoughts in, in general as a as a Leash man? I mean, again, I suppose another just very disappointing game performance. I mean, I'd be curious to hear your thoughts on it, I suppose. Yeah, sure. Listen, obviously, I was gutted myself because... Um, you know, Leash fans, we have this kind of thing about us that, you know, we could get like that. We got five bad beatings in the league. And yet when championship comes around, we still think there's going to be a switch or a button to to hit. And, you know, things might work out or we might have learned something from the league encounter with Wexford and things could have been a bit better. But, you know, in fact, it was much worse. Um, yeah, it was just dreadful from, from, you know, from the first minute, I suppose there was a bit of hope. There was a kind of a bit of a melee in, in the midfield from the first minute and Leash turned over a ball with a big hit and won a free and the whole, you know, the crowd that was down there rose to their feet and you, you kind of give yourself hope thinking, you know, hopefully this is what we're in for, for you know, 50, 60 minutes. Um, and then, you know, PJ Scully came out, took the free and it went wide and it ne- nearly seemed to deflate the whole 40 second balloon that I was talking about there and things just went pear shaped after that. Um, the puckouts, I suppose, were were a key element for me. Um, just looking at some of the stats there, like uh, Wexford, would you believe it or not, won ninety five percent of their own puckouts. Did forty two puckouts, and they won forty of them. Um, now a lot of them were uncontested, a lot of them were short, and that was the leash game plan. They dragged kind of everyone back, um, which in hindsight seems a bit crazy, but I suppose they had a game plan. They were going with it, but it didn't work, and it badly, badly backfired. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. Like, and even when you kind of alluded to it there, do you think it is kind of a confidence thing as well, maybe with some of the, the leash lads as well? Where, like, when you said, when PJ Scully has that free and it goes wide, and I suppose maybe with the atmosphere as well, like, you can probably feel it at different points as well that all it is is one small mistake or one small error, and then all of a sudden you're on the back foot and, and confidence is, is drained, then I suppose as well. It's definitely, definitely a big thing, and especially in Leash. Like, and kind of that, just as you say that now, that brings you back to a few years ago when Leash ran Galway in the Leinster Championship. And I think it could have been three or four points up with three or four minutes left on the clock. And like that, um, it got through, and it was a goal chance and spurred the goal chance, and it should have buried it. And like that as well, you know, the confidence seemed to go, oh, oh, and next thing straight down the fire, and Joe Cannon buried one. And next thing, back to a pint, Galway knocked on three or four pints near the end and, you know, Leach were beaten again. Another kind of hard luck story, but it is them moments, I suppose. And just unfortunately for this one, the moment came within the first minute of the game um, and the whole kind of effort seemed to deflate straight away. But, um, you know, just from, from looking at the Leach setup, I suppose, the, the way they set up, like they, they knew obviously we actually were going to play a sweeper. Kevin Foley came back as he does, as he has been doing for all the league. Um, so they knew that, so they, they kind of set up in a way that there was going to be two on the full back line. There was going to be a man kind of def- 
you know, sitting in front of the two on the full back line. So it was nearly a two one, three on the half back line. They were playing three in midfield. They were playing three in the half forward line, and then they were playing two full forwards if you'd like, kind of in a row. So no corner forwards. But again, you know that that it didn't work because Wexford were so easily, as I said, with the puck outs a few minutes ago, they were so easy to pick out and so confident to pick out the cornerbacks or anyone on the full back line really. Um, and you know to start an attack from there after a puck out. Um, which uh, was Talisha's detrimental, I suppose. Yeah, like, and I suppose in general, like, where do you think it's it's it has gone wrong? I suppose for Alicia. I know obviously it's very competitive in there. You know, when you look at the teams that you have to come up against, you're talking about some of the best teams in in the country. And obviously the level in hurling has definitely rose in the past couple of years. When you look at the likes of your Wexfords and your Limericks, and well, I think back to, to Eddie Brennan and obviously my own county Dublin. When you knocked us out there in 2019. <laughs> It seemed mm. like, you know, Leash were on the up and Dublin were on the down. And, you know, I suppose in the end, since then, unfortunately, like it's it's probably not really gone maybe as planned, I suppose, for most Leash fans and, and, and supporters. Yeah, and that's, I suppose, that's what makes it nearly all the worst because there was that so much hope there two years ago. And even last year, like they, they ran Clare to a point and, and probably should have beaten Clare mm. last year in the championship. Um, and Claire went on actually after that game to annihilate Wexford in the next round, you know. So even even from last year, you know, it has seemed to gone backwards, um, which is unfortunate because they've they've got a few key players back even from last year. Chad Aware wasn't playing last year, PJ Scully wasn't playing last year, Ana Lyons wasn't playing last year. You know, there are three big players for Leash to, to come in and to kick on. And like I suppose the whole county was hoping that they would kick on, but just for whatever reason, it's hard to pinpoint it. Um, that it didn't kick on um, you know it's, it's easy to point the finger of blame I suppose and some people are are kind of pointing the blame at Cheddar Plunkett but maybe that's too easy at times to do that um, but it's, it, I suppose it is very hard to, to pinpoint where it's gone wrong um, a lot of very bad injuries early on during the year and the short period of time so it's, it's hard to, to tell like I suppose all that Leach could hope for really is that they win if two big relegations coming up, matches coming up now in the next few weeks, they're playing Antrim and you know, obviously the relegation. Uh, if they lose that, they're down to Joe McDonough um, and they're playing Westmead in the relegation of the league. If they lose that, they're down to Division 2. So two big uh, games coming up. And I, you know, I think if they can win them, they can go on and build for next year um, with the squad that they have because they said they have probably in Leash Club Hurling, I did a lot of the commentary for the, the Leash Club Hurling games last year. And from what I've seen from, well, I've seen every game last year in the club championship, you know, they have the best maybe 22, 23 hurlers in the squad. And, you know, so they have the talent that's that's in the county to have it there, to have it on the field. But just for some reason, it's not clicking or not working this year. Yeah, yeah, 100%. And like you alluded to it there, Antrim next. I mean, I suppose Antrim were, were coming into the Dublin game, I suppose, with a lot of positivity after a very competitive league. Obviously, beat yourselves in the league and beat Clare and drew a Wexford, very, very competitive, even against Kilkenny as well. So I suppose, how would you how would you think you would fare going into, into that game and in the in the relegation playoff? Yeah, like I'm very worried about that game. Um, like that, that for me actually, and I know you're not going to like this, but that for me was the biggest shock of the weekend. And not yeah. the fact that Dublin, not the fact that Dublin won it, but that they won it so comprehensively because I was expecting a dog fight in that. I thought it might come down to a pint or two. And I thought actually Antrim could have, you know, snuck it, but Dublin really turned on the, the burners and, you know, off they went and fair play to them. Um, Antrim will be devastated because as you know, as I spoke a few minutes ago stats now and big stat man and looking at the stats in the league Antrim were actually the most efficient team in Division 1B of the league as in regards shooting their shooting was excellent um, and you know that just didn't click for them the other day and, and as you said earlier on you know the, the standard that has gone to now that if you had that if you have that bad day now you can be punished so badly whereas a few years ago you could have a bad day and you could still be in the game with you know, five, ten minutes to go. Nowadays, if you have a bad day, there's teams, you know, really kind of putting that kind of to Kenny, um, how do you call it, um, killer instinct, I suppose, into it and really finishing off teams. And Dublin, fairness to them, did that again, Antrim, the other day. But so Antrim, you know, they'll have a sting in their tail again coming in to the Leash match. Um, I don't think any hinges on this moment as well, this match with Leash, because, you know, after the Super League that they had, if they got relegated down to the to Joe McDonough for next year, that'll be a huge, huge uh, blow for them. So, huge game for Antrim. And, and probably, 
if truth be told, there's probably more pressure on Antrim coming into this game than there is Leash. Yeah, that's very true. All right. And yeah, like like we alluded to it there with, with Dublin, like getting the victory, to be honest with you. I think a lot of Dublin fans and even a lot of people I've had on the podcast recently have all kind of maybe gone with, with Antrim maybe to get that win. I think a lot of people felt like Antrim were, were coming in with more momentum than than Dublin and they, they probably were in all fairness. I suppose just a word on, on Wexford, first of all. Like, I mean, a very comprehensive win in the end, scoring 531. Where do you see them in the, going into the, you know, the All-Ireland or the, the Leinster semis now? Uh, I suppose another year under Davy Fitz um, and I suppose two years ago won the, the Leinster Championship so I suppose they're always going to be there or thereabouts Yeah they definitely are um, I suppose the, the only fear I'd have for Wexford coming into that Kilkenny game is the fact that they got no tests whatsoever mm-hmm. against Leash um, and it's, it's, it's very very easy from from playing a few like a few years ago myself and from seeing games over the years, it's nearly the worst thing you can hope for coming into a big game is an easy defeat beforehand because you get stuck in them kind of lazy tactics, lazy kind of, you know, oh, I don't have to run for this ball or I don't need to win this ball or and you know that that mindset can say now David will be trying his best to change that mindset over the next uh, week. Um but as I said it is very hard to get out of that mindset from having it so comfortable. And for having so much time on the ball to literally being hunted down like dogs against Kenny, which is what they're going to be like, you know. So it's going to go from having maybe five, ten seconds on a ball to having 0.7 seconds on a ball, you know, to make that decision. So their decision making is going to have to be up to scratch. Now, you know, I, I can't see them beating to Kenny to the show. I still think to Kenny are a force to be reckoned with. But I, I do see Wexford going into the qualifiers and having a serious run in the qualifiers after that but you know um, Davey I suppose you said it's his fifth year now he'll, he'll want to start making ground if he doesn't there'll be probably movement in Wex, within Wexford um, next year but yeah but uh, that's the only fear I suppose I would have for him. I'd like to see him giving a good game but the only fear would be that they would come into it a bit too casual yeah 100% yeah like and I suppose, yeah, because we we seen obviously two years ago when they when they overturned Kilkenny, like they always seem to like Davy Fitz in particular always seems to have a bit of a a master stroke. I suppose even when you think back to his uh, his clear days as well. So it will certainly be interesting to to keep an eye on on that game and, and how it goes. I suppose we were touching on the Dublin and Antrim game there as well. Like we'll we'll look at that in more detail now. Like it was Dublin three thirty one, Antrim twenty two points. Like uh, to be honest with you, I can't remember the last time Dublin put up a score of of three thirty one. In a, in a in a match like in in the championship and you know on the day like because I thought last year in particular with Dublin we were a bit too reliant on Donald Burke but I feel like this year with the likes of Ronan Hayes and and Keen Boland who've come into the team I suppose and and given the fact that obviously the, the under twenties beat Galway there during the week as well I suppose it you know maybe Dublin are on the up mm-hmm. after all considering a lot of people kind of felt that maybe they're actually on a on a downward spiral. Yeah, very true. And going back to that game that you mentioned back in 2019 when Leash knocked him out, you know, maybe that was kind of the, the kick in the arse maybe that Dublin Hurling needed, you know, because they do mm. seem to have, since that, they do seem to have turned it around. Um, And, you know, I'm actually delighted for Matty Kenny because I know a lot of cooler boys up there and I know they have huge time for him. And I know, you know, it didn't work out for him the first year he was there. Last year, you know, kind of average enough year, I suppose. So I'd like to see him getting a good year good run on it this year I suppose and um, having a, a good successful year with Dublin and by all means by that by that um, win the other day against Antrim there's nothing to say that, that Dublin can't be a serious force in Leinster as well Yeah like and obviously Galway next and obviously the last time Dublin and Galway played each other of course in the, in the championship Dublin got that win just before the Leash game could you see anything similar happening there? Do you think Dublin could put it up to Galway or cause a shock? I mean, I suppose back then, obviously, Joe Cannon wasn't on the pitch when Dublin played Galway two years ago and obviously was in Parnell Park as well. I think this one's in Crow Park from what, from what I know. But like, what do you reckon? How, how, how do you reckon Dublin would, would get on against uh, the tribesmen in that game? Yeah, like, again, it's a kind of a crazy situation because, you know, if I was talking to you Friday evening and you asked me that question, I'd say, you know, absolutely no chance because I just, I, I do feel Galway are very much all Ireland contenders. And I do think they're the, the one team that can shift the power from Limerick. Um, you know, but given that performance from Dublin the other day, then, 
you know, Dublin are kind of, they're like that as well. That, that kind of the Jack McKinney mentality of hunting down and Galway don't like being hunted down. Galway like time in the ball. They like, you know, the fancy flicks. And, you know, I think if Dublin stick it into them, they really need to stick it into them. Matty Kenny, I know well, he'll have a, a great game plan to come up with to counteract some of their big stars. Um, you know, I, I can see it being a lot closer than I would have thought on Friday. I can see it being a lot closer. I still would fancy Galway to get over the line. Because I said, I do think they're, they're serious contenders this year um, and they will push Limerick. But, you know, um, a, a good performance, I think, would still be be a good uh, omen, I suppose, for Dublin to go go further. Yeah, like it's a weird one with Dublin at times. Like I even look back to the Kilkenny game last year where we looked dead and buried and then the second half went on a unbelievable run. I think we were 16, 17 points down and, and nearly came back and won the game. But yeah, like what you said, Galway, probably the, the closest to Limerick at the moment. And if anyone's going to end Limerick's reign this year, you'd probably feel that Galway are, are probably best placed at, at this moment in time. And I suppose looking at some of the, the scores on the day for Dublin, like you had the likes of Danny Sutcliffe in there and Ronan Hayes and, and Keane Boland. I suppose Danny Sutcliffe in particular, you know, it's been a while really since he's produced, I suppose, his, his top level of hurling. And in this game, he was fantastic. Like, do you think he would be, like him being on form would be imperative as well to Dublin if they were to to cause a surprise or two against the Galway and maybe beyond? Uh, definitely, 100%. He has to be on top of his game if Dublin have, have any chance in this game, you know. But like that, he, he is a top class and probably exactly what you said there as well. We haven't seen the top classes performance that we know he's capable of. Um, in the past, in the past, this was for Dublin. But if any, if that match on um, Saturday's end go by, then yeah, him him top of his game will give Galway um, a few things to think about. All right. Mm. And I suppose from an Antrim point of view, I mean, like like we were kind of alluding to it earlier, like uh, definitely a surprise defeat, not necessarily losing to Dublin. I think although most people had Antrim as, as the winners, I don't think many people would have expected Dublin to win as convincingly as they did. Do you think it was maybe a case that they had exerted so much energy in the league? You know, they were so focused on staying up. They were so focused on maybe making a statement and maybe responding to, to some of the down low comments and whatnot. Do you think maybe they just kind of ran out of steam a bit kind of in this game? Yeah, I, th- I think there's two kind of elements to it. I think that's definitely one of it that they did. They put in a huge effort in the league and, you know, the, the work rate and, you know, they, could, they couldn't keep that up over a long period of time. The second part of it, I do think, was a bit of stage fright. And there are certain counties that love coming into games as underdogs. And I suppose, as you said earlier on as well, with a lot of people actually tipping Antrim to win this game, you know, they found themselves going into it maybe a slight favourites, which doesn't suit Antrim, it doesn't suit Leash, doesn't suit a lot of kind of the smaller counties to be going into a big game as favourites. They prefer going into it as underdogs and then they can let loose. So I think there was a bit of stage fright there as well from Antrim. Um, and that's, again, why I think there's more pressure actually on them next week because uh, if they don't perform again Leash in that relegation final, then it'll be uh, seen as a disaster of a year um, for Gleeson there up in up in Antrim. Yeah, because I suppose it, w- it would almost be like a step back in, in many ways. I mean, considering how well they've done in the league. And I know they'll be in Division 1 again next year, but I think everyone really v- would have had them staying in the in the Leinster Championship at least and being competitive and, and all the rest. So you'd have to, it would definitely would be a step back like if they were to, to be beaten by Leash and next weekend or, or whenever that game is. 100%. Yeah. And, and like, I suppose there is such tight margins there because you know, as you said, two years ago, Leash had that great win over Dublin, thought they were on the up, and then two years later, you find them, you know, down kind of nearly rock bottom again, and and having to rebuild again. Antrim were the team this year that we're, we're all talking about that are on the up, on the up, and next thing, one defeat, and next thing we're talking about, you know, possibly back in the Joe McDonough uh, Cup next year, you know. So it's there is fine margins there, you know. Carlo do it as well. They come up, have a great, had a great year there. Was it in two thousand eighteen? Maybe had a great year. Um, and then you know if they've gone right back down again, um, and they start to climb again. So I think there's there is four or five counties there that are probably around the same level, and they're kind of clutching at straws. Maybe one has a good year one year, next thing there's a failure the following year. You know, but it's finding that consistency, I suppose, to try and get up and to match, you know, the the, the Wexfords, the Dublins, the 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 Clares, maybe, um, that that the weaker counties need to do in the next few years. 
Yeah, and I think nearly maybe another thing as well is I think maybe one of the reasons why probably a lot of people had Antrim as favourites is probably maybe the need for a lot of the of, of those weaker counties, like you said before, to be competitive and to get up there. Because I think even in football as well, I think, you know, you're going to get bored when you see the same. And I know it's it might sound a bit funny coming from a Dublin fan, but you get a bit you get a bit bored when you see the same old teams year on year you know, winning the same provincial titles, winning the same, you know, it's the same games, the same matches. And I think that's why in the past, you know, five to 10 years when we've seen Wexford come up, we've seen Limerick kind of on the rise, Clare won an All-Ireland there in 2013. I feel like there there is a need there to kind of try and get those weaker counties, maybe not maybe to the same level, but at least competitive where they can cause a shock against a Clare or a Waterford and, and whatnot. Exactly, yeah, yeah. And like, you know, like you said, they're like the Leinster Football Championship, you know, is that kind of like, you know, you draw Dublin in the Leinster Football Championship, any of the other counties, and now it is. Whereas, you know, you go back back 15 years and, you know, a Dublin and Mead game or a, a Kildare and Leash game would have had huge kind of buzz around it. Now that kind of buzz is gone, like, you know, so we'd, you'd be hoping that it doesn't go like that and that the weaker counties can kind of up their game and, and, cause one of them shocks and knock a big team. And it's a pity last year that even, you know, Leash didn't didn't turn over Clare that day because, you know, the, again, they're the kind of results that we need in this game to, um, to you know, make it beneficial, I suppose, to the sport. Mm. I suppose moving on from that, obviously, in uh, in Munster, you had Clare up against Waterford. Clare winning 122 to, to 21 points, a four-point victory in the end. I suppose it was a, an interesting game because in the first half, you really felt that Clare could have won this convincingly. They could have put out a real statement. They probably, you know, the amount of wides they had in the game was, was, was I think they had 22 or 23 wides or something like that in total. Um, I mean, they probably should have won it quite comfortably in the end, but I suppose in the end, they'll be happy to, to get this victory and I suppose on to, to Tipperary next. Yeah, they'll, they'll be absolutely thrilled because I think even a lot of, newspapers over the weekend and even before the weekend were all tipping Waterford and were kind of, you know, I, I read a few reports there and they weren't giving Clare much chance at all. So I suppose Brian Lowen had that a few of them pinned up in his his locker room before the game. Um, I was surprised how comfortable Clare were and how, I suppose, um, quiet Waterford. I was really expecting, expecting a lot from Waterford this year and especially after their league campaign and the inside forward line, I thought, during the league was unbelievable. Like the goals that we were getting, the movement from them, and just, you know, I just did, again didn't see that whatsoever against Clare. Um, very disappointed with with their with their performance. Um, and then you know, I was looking at, again at puckouts and stuff like that, and like Clare had had thirty four puckouts, won seventy six percent of their own puckouts, and Waterford had forty four puckouts, um, and won. Sorry, 30 out of the 44, so 68 percent. So that possession from the puck out seemed to have a big effect for Clare because they were able to again uncontested kind of bring it on and and work a score fairly easily. And as you said, if they had their their shooting boots on or shooting radars, I suppose, in the first half, they could have been home and dry by half time. Um good friend there of Derek McGrath is now, and I was texting them <laughs> half time there. I was saying you're in big trouble here. And he didn't think so at all. He thought, no, 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 it's still there and we'll turn it on the second half. But um, yeah, no, I, I didn't see it, to be honest now. And I was, I was maybe, maybe surprised that it was only a four-point win because I thought Clare were, you know, probably a 10-point 10 10, 10 better team on the day overall. I know Warford came back into it fairly well, but overall I was very disappointed with the Warford performance. Yeah, like you were kind of waiting for for Waterford to turn it on in, in many ways. And when I was watching the first half, it, it reminded me a lot actually when Waterford played Kilkenny last year in the, in the All Ireland semi final in the first half, where Waterford were really poor in the first half, then completely changed the game completely in the second half. And you were wondering, could they do something similar here? But yeah, like they did rally late on, and Austin Gleason, I suppose, was fantastic towards the end. But I suppose with the injuries that they have with the likes of Connor Prunty and, and Jamie Barron and Tyg the Burke. I suppose it's it's going to be very hard to see how Waterford build on last year and get get to those same heights and, and levels again. It is, yeah. And like, you know, them three hurlers that just mentioned, like you take them out of any team in the country, mm. they're going to struggle, like, you know, um, especially Ty Burke, like I think he's one of the finest hurlers in Ireland at the moment. But um 
yeah, I suppose like uh, we're all waiting for that that kind of bit of magic, you know. And down through the years, you know, you you talk about the the John Milans, the Dan Shanahan's, the the kind of that bit of spark that they brought, and and kind of I I nearly put Desi Hutchinson in that bracket now, where yeah, I, I think he is that he is that moment of magic in him, and I was just waiting for it to kind of spark off the game because I think the game even needed something like that, um, to to liven it up a bit, but it just never came. And I didn't even, not even did it not come. It, it didn't really seem like coming, to be fair. Um, you know, I know I did one or two kind of half chances, but there was no kind of clear cut where they could declare defence wide open and were throwing goal, like, you know. And that, that to me, is probably the most disappointing thing from Liam Cahill's side on Sunday. And I'm sure he'll be disgusted with that performance um, looking back at the, at the game today or tomorrow. Yeah, yeah, no, like, I definitely think he'll have, he'll have a lot of... Uh words all right to say to his team and for Clare like looking at John Conlon in particular at centre back obviously normally operating in around the forward line I suppose like in the Antrim game in particular you know I think a lot of people a lot of Clare people in particular were all calling for him to be moved back up to up to the forwards but I suppose to be fair to Brian Lohan he's stuck with it and I suppose it's paid off in the end because he was man of the match yesterday he was fun he done a phenomenal job in there at, uh, at centre back Oh, yeah, in fairness, Brian Lohan definitely reaped the rewards of being consistent because I was one of the ones that was saying a ridiculous move and, you know, moving back up the field and, you know, he's wasted our centre-back. And then just to see the performance he put in at centre-back mm-hmm. the other day was unbelievable. You know, and you go back to, again, to clear legends, you know, you talk about Shawnee McMahon back there from years ago. You know, it was that kind of performance from um from the clear man. I think that, you know, that, that stood out. But, yeah, Conlon was superb and... and you know, maybe he made us eat a bit of, of uh, humble pie there with, with the performance. Yeah, absolutely. It was something else altogether, like it really, really was. And like looking at Claire in particular after that victory going on now to Tipperary, I suppose, like even I was saying on, on a different podcast, I feel like even the Tony Kelly injury through the league might have helped them because we've seen Aid McCarthy step up and Mark Rogers come into the team and Aaron Shanahan always, always looks like a threat as well. Like where do you think they could be dark horses even maybe potentially in maybe in Munster and in the All Ireland or do you think they're still a bit behind some of the the top teams? Yeah, I, I think they're still a bit behind, but I I do kind of fancy them now. I have to say against Tipperary, I think they're coming into this Tip game in the best possible way because they didn't whitewash Waterford, they didn't walk away with the game. They only won it by four points. They they're shooting. They had 46 shots on goal, 23 of them converted. So only 50% conversion rate. Now, usually any championship game, especially a Munster championship game, if you only have 50% uh, of um, efficiency in your shooting, you're not going to win that game. You know, and still they won the game. They won it convincingly. So I think they'll be kind of, they have a lot to work on in the next two weeks. Uh, Tip won't be kind of shaking in their boots by their forms, but Jay Clare will be coming into that with a, a bit of a swagger to them and I can see them shaking and possibly even overturning tip in two weeks time yeah like because we like we, we know they have the players to do it, obviously and we've seen even one or two uncharacteristic wides at times from Tony Kelly and you know normally if you're creating like if, if Claire were to create 46 chances again against Tipperary you'd probably bank on them to get a lot more than, than 23 this time around so it is going to be a very fascinating game indeed like and I suppose just touching on Tipperary briefly like obviously looking at their league campaign, I suppose they've been very loyal. Like Liam Sheedy's been very loyal in many ways to the likes of your Shamie Callnans and your Nolan John McGraths and hasn't maybe done what the likes of your Limericks have done and brought through some of the the younger lads. So like, what have you made of uh, of Tipperary so far? Yeah, and I think that loyalty might actually come back um, to bite Sheedy a bit because you know you you alluded to there a few there a few minutes ago about Claire being able to kind of bring in these these lads and test them out. Tip haven't really done that, you know. And I think when the chips are down and they're they're struggling or they're the pin they're at the pin of the collar, that they won't know where to turn. He won't know, you know, who can change his game for me. And and that's why I actually I do fancy Claire to possibly turn him over. But as we said earlier on, I think they're still a bit behind the likes of Limerick Galways. Um, so I, I don't think they'll be pushing for Munster championships this year, but I can't see him in the Munster final, possibly. Mm. 
Hundred percent, yeah. Like, and I suppose moving on to the Joe McDonough Cup, we'll touch on some of the results there briefly. Obviously, Kerry beat uh, down two twenty four to one twenty one, and Carlo got past uh, Kildare two twenty two to three sixteen. I suppose for Kerry, like I think most people would probably have them as as maybe favourites with the fact that obviously you don't have Offaly in there, considering how good of a, a league campaign the Offaly had, and they play Mead, of course, next in the in the group stages. So you'd have to fancy them to come through that and at, at the bare minimum make the final now at this stage. Yeah, definitely so. Like I, I I'm, uh, I'd be very surprised if it wasn't a Kerry Carlo final this year. And that's no respect to the other teams, but I just think they are that bit, that bit further ahead. Um, and I think that that will actually be a great game, that Kerry Carlo game in the final, if, if, it, is, if it does work out that way. Um, because I think they're very evenly matched. Um, Carlos seem to be going well this year they're putting up big scores um, which you know again not kind of a thing you'd associate with Carlo usually Carlo or kind of a team that would nearly drag you down to their level and you know it might be a 17 points to 18 point game but they're putting up big scores this year they're they're rattling in the goals as well which is good to see um, and you know I, yeah I hope we're I'm back in a few weeks talking about this game because I do think it'll be an exciting Joe McDonough Cup final um, where you don't have as you said an awfully or kind of a a, a team that would think they're bigger than, than the competition in it and it should be a great final in a few weeks Yeah like and I suppose for Kildare obviously who, who got beat by Carlo I mean they've definitely made massive strides obviously this year you know coming up from Division 2B and then you know running Carlo quite close like in many ways they'll be very happy with their performance and they'll be happy that they came so close but you would feel that this, they, they'd also probably look at this as a bit of a missed opportunity because if they come through this game, a massive chance to potentially go to a Joe McDonough Cup final. And then I suppose from there, you would have never known. But I suppose a bit of a, a bit of a missed opportunity in many ways for Kildare. Yeah, missed opportunity, but still, I, I'd, I'd say they're, they're quietly happy there. I'd say they're building down there. I know that the Kildare minor hurlers this year are meant to be extremely good. They've nine... Uh, nine lads from Nace on the team, I think, as far as I know. And that team that would have won the Fela under 14B a few years ago. So, you know, they're they're quite confident of getting a good Leinster minor hurling run this year as well. So they're playing Carlo actually in the first round as well on Wednesday night um, in Carlo. So, you know, a lot, a lot of people would say if, if they can turn over Carlo there, that'd be a shock. I, I don't think it will be a shock. I, th- I, think, I think they will turn over Carlo. Um, and they'll have a crack then at leash in a few weeks' time. But like that, it's a good place for Kildare. They're getting the numbers behind it. They're starting to, to pump the money into the hurling side of things, which was never done before. And they're starting to reap the rewards of that too. Yeah, 100%. Like, and I think like what we were alluding to earlier, like I think we all want to see new teams coming up and new teams challenging and even seeing the likes of your, your Offaly's coming up and even you know leashes in, in recent years as well. And um, well, yeah, look, listen, I suppose we'll wrap this up here anyway, Damien. Uh, appreciate you jumping on. Appreciate your time. It's good to, to look back on the on the hurling action. No water. Thanks for being in Ireland. Thanks for having me on.